Okay, and so we're moving on to look at the in-group over-exclusion effect. And this work is reported in the paper in Social Psychology with my colleague Stefania Paolini, uh, where we gave it the catchy title, Outgroup Flies in the In-Group's Ointment. Um, so what we were trying to get across with that is this idea that sometimes uh, a little thing in your group can cause you a lot of discomfort and want you to exclude that little thing. So the in-group over-exclusion effect basically is all about excluding potential out-group members. You're not sure one way or the other whether or not they're part of your group or not. And you have this doubt, this ambiguity about who they are. And when faced with that ambiguity, people tend to be over-cautious and over-exclude those people and say they're definitely not part of our group. So we wanted to look at the motivation behind that. Why are people so uh, worried and, and concerned about letting these other people into their group um, and, and, and what's behind it? So we were looking at the motivational underpinnings of the in-group over-exclusion effect here. Perhaps a more formal definition might help us. So the in-group over-exclusion effect uh, is an intergroup effect in which people are more likely to classify ambiguous individuals as members of the outgroup rather than the in-group. So the key word there, I think, is ambiguous because, you know, if you're completely sure that this person's a part of your group, then there's no problem, you'll let them stay. It's only the people who are ambiguous. You're not sure one way or the other. Those are the people who you worry about. Um, now, yeah, so if you're in any, any doubt about whether someone's an in-group or an out-group member, you're likely to err on the side of caution and call them an out-group member. So let me give you an example here. Uh, the example's not me, the example is him. And the question I want to ask you is, is that guy a liberal or a conservative? So does that person in front of you now uh, hold liberal political values or conservative political values? And, I don't know, I put this picture up before and some people have st strong views one way and some people have strong views the other way, which I think says to us that it's not really clear uh, what, he, what he looks like um, and what kind of opinions he has. So it's ambiguous. Now, the, the answer to that question, is that guy a liberal or conservative? Social psychologists have found that the answer will sometimes depend on what group you belong to. So if you have liberal values you count yourself as, as being a sort of liberal on the political spectrum, then you'll probably guess that the man is a conservative. And if you're a conservative, then you'll probably guess that he's a liberal. And this is the mysterious in-group over-exclusion effect. And what it is, is like if you're in doubt, if faced with a potentially ambiguous member of your group, uh, then you will keep them out, essentially. So the um, in-group over-exclusion effect has been observed when people make judgments of group membership based on people's faces, some of which have been digitally morphed to contain a mixture of in-group and out-group stereotypical features. So if we're thinking about black and white people, for example, and you're trying to figure out, is that person a member of one group or the other, then you might run into difficulty here. So black and, and white participants might be faced with stimuli like this and asked about the racially ambiguous faces. Are they black or white? In this case, the in-group over-exclusion effect would take the form of black participants saying that this is a white face and white, face, white participants saying that this is a black face. In other words, both black and white participants would over-exclude ambiguous faces and claim that the face belongs to an out-group member rather than an in-group member. Again, the idea is to sort of keep the in-group pure and untainted by potential out-group members. In other words, to keep the out-group flies out of your in-group uh, ointment, as it were. I personally think that the child of Bush and Obama looks quite handsome, but that's my own opinion. So why are people doing this then? What's the motivation to keep people out? And um, Leons and Isabet, uh, came up with their solution, which was, again, based on social identity theory. So they argued that uh, there is a motivational explanation here, that people are motivated to protect their in-group from intrusion, contamination, or even pollution, if you like, by negatively valued out-group members 
in order to protect the positivity of their associated social identity and self-esteem. So if those no good out group members get into your in group, then they'll sully your group with their negativity. And since part of your self-esteem is derived from belonging to a positive in group, you're motivated to err on the side of caution and make sure that you exclude anyone from your group who shows even a hint of being an out group member. So can you spot the out group member, the out group imposter trying to infiltrate the in group here? Uh, one of these fellas uh, is certainly not fitting in, doing his best to try and fit in, should be excluded from the out group but not doing, doing much, or should be excluded from the in group, should I say. And again, I don't know if you can spot the intruder here into the in group, uh, trying to fit in, but these cats need to engage in a little bit more um, over exclusion in order to purify their cat in group and make sure that it's not sullied by any of these nasty dog uh, out group members because they, they, they're proud to be cats as you can quite clearly see from the faces, possibly not that one. Um, and they, you know, they, they <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm gonna be uh, convincing you here, but they derive a sense of self-esteem and satisfaction from belonging to a cat in group and their social identities as cats and their self-esteem as being a cat would be threatened if one of these creatures entered into their in-group. So those are the sort of principles that would apply to us humans. Now what evidence is there for this, um, this in-group over-exclusion effect? In particular, what evidence is there for the social identity motivational explanation? Well, that uh, evidence comes from Italy, from the University of Padua, uh, and in particular a study by Emmanuel Castano and his colleagues in 2002. Those researchers measured North Italian participants in group identification with their region. So these were North Italians and they measured, uh, you know, how much do you feel like you're a North Italian? Do you identify with North Italians? So we have a measure of the social identification that these people had with other Northern Italians. Participants then categorized a series of faces as either Northern Italian or Southern Italian. Now an important thing to note here is that Northern Italians are stereotyped as having fairer skin than Southern Italians. So these faces would look different depending on whether or not they are Northern or Southern Italian. And the researchers found that the high identifiers, the ones who agreed strongly that they identified with being Northern Italian, were more likely than the low identifiers to categorize the faces as Southern Italian. In other words, consistent with the social identity explanation, in-group identification moderated the size of the in-group over-exclusion effect. The higher you identified, the more likely you were to kick out Southern Italians, or these, to be more accurate, these ambiguous faces, who you weren't sure whether they were Northern or Southern Italian, the more likely you were to kick them out of your group, which kind of um, fits the logic of the social identity explanation. And that is that you are doing it for the sake of your group and for the sake of your identity and for the sake of your self-esteem. So this research does in fact suggest that social identity is implicated in the in-group over-exclusion effect. However, it does also leave some important questions unanswered. Although we now know that people are more likely to show the in-group over-exclusion effect when they identify with their in-group, it remains unclear exactly why they show that effect. The assumption is that people attempt to protect the in-group's positivity and consequently meet their need for self-esteem. However, that assumption has never been tested directly. And it's important to carry out that type of test in order to rule out other plausible explanations of the in-group over-exclusion effect that also predict a relationship between in-group over-exclusion and in-group identification. So what are those other potential explanations? Well, there are two of them that we thought might be plausible. Um, so it's possible that the in-group over-exclusion effect occurs because people are motivated to limit the size of their in-group in order to, to secure sufficient material resources for in-group members. If you think about it, a lot, the larger the group, the less there is of stuff to go around people. So it's in your interest to, if you're in doubt about who's in and who's out, it's in your interest, sort of um, from a resource-based uh, perspective, just to kick people out. Say, so, oh, I'm not sure one way or another whether or not they're in-group or out-group, kick them out. There's more chocolate for us then. Also, by kicking them out, you achieve a more distinctive in-group. 
So you don't blur the in-group and uh, with, with people who are a bit ambiguous. You have a very smaller, perhaps, and more distinctive in-group. Notably, uh, that in-group size explanation will predict that the in-group over-exclusion effect is moderated by in-group identification because higher identifiers will be more concerned about their group's resources and their group's distinctiveness. Hence, the fact that in-group identification moderates the in-group over-exclusion effect, which is what Castanot and colleagues found, doesn't necessarily imply exclusive support for Lyons and Isabit's uh, motivational explanation. The thing that's missing here, really, at the end of the day, is self-esteem. So the whole explanation is saying people are doing it in order to have a positively distinct social identity because that will help them to feel good about themselves. And we have shown, we've found from Castano's research that yes, identity is involved, but the missing ingredient and the thing that we wanted to look at was the self-esteem aspect. Yes, identity is involved, but as we've seen here, uh, there are a number of other reasons why identity could be involved apart from the self-esteem angle. So the question is, can we really pin this process down to self-esteem? So that's what we looked at in our study. We had a couple of predictions. First of all, if the over-exclusion effect is caused by the need to protect the in-group's positivity, then it should only occur when the in-group is positive and the out-group is negative, and not vice versa, because it's only in that situation that group members would be motivated to keep the nasty negative out-group members out of their nice positive in-group. However, the in-group over-exclusion effect should be weakened, nullified, or even reversed when the in-group has a negative valence and the out-group has a positive valence, because in that situation, group members would not be motivated to keep positive out-group members out of their negative in-group. In fact, you might argue that they want to get these positive out-group members into their really crappy in-group. You know, our group's not doing very well, and suddenly we've got these people. Are they in-group members or are they out-group members? Not really sure, but they're very positive. They've got a high status. They've got lots of money and so on. Yeah, I'm going to call them part of our group. That kind of mentality might even reverse the in-group over-exclusion effect. We also tested a second prediction, which is if the in-group over-exclusion effect is caused by the need for self-esteem, which is what all these people are saying, then people who have a low self-esteem would be most likely to display the effect because they have the greatest need for self-esteem. So if you have low self-esteem, the argument goes you probably want to try to improve it. And one way to improve it would be to engage in, in behaviours and activities which, which make you feel better and good about yourself. The in-group over-exclusion effect is exactly that kind of thing. So you should probably do it more than people who've got high self-esteem because they already feel good about themselves. No need to start kicking poor people out of your in-group. So it's important to note that both of those predictions, predictions one and two, are um, specific to Leon's and Isabet's motivational explanation and neither can be derived from explanations based on material resources or the need for distinctiveness per se. So off we went and we collected data from 122 domestic students at uh, the University of Newcastle. There were 48 men and 74 women and these were young people around about 23 years of age. And they uh, came along and took part in a study which was described as a memory task in social groups. And they were told that the research was investigating implicit learning and memory recall for people in social groups who are placed in positive and negative contexts. So the first thing that they did was to complete um, the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, an uh, enormously uh, widely used scale. Um, you know, it is the self-esteem scale, so it's a very good measure of self-esteem. Uh, it's a simple one, 10 statements, and it's very face-valid items such as, I feel like I have a number of good qualities. Score high on that, and you uh, are on the way to being reporting high self-esteem. The next thing that participants did after we measured their self-esteem was they were confronted on a computer with a screen like this, basically. And this, uh, I don't know if you can tell from the drawings here, but we tried to uh, use our artistic skills to create a bucket of soapy water, all clean with bubbles and so on, and a dustbin with um, rubbish in it, dirty newspapers, old fish bones, uh, and so on. Um, and we did tell participants, look, if you can't guess, these are what these things are, just in case our brilliant artistic uh, skills were lost on them. 
So this was part of the memory recall task. Um, and they were presented with a series of diagrams like this one. And each diagram showed two groups of people. So these numbers here represent the groups of people. Each person was represented by a code number from 1 to 20. So one group was located on the left side of the computer screen inside this bucket of soapy water. And the other group was located on the right side of the screen inside a picture of a dustbin of rubbish. And we asked participants to consider the people in the bucket as being clean, in inverted commas, and the people in the dustbin as being dirty. So you've got dirty old 18 and lovely clean number four. So quite obviously then we've got, again, this is kind of like a minimal group situation. And what we've got here is two groups, a clean group and a dirty group. And why did we call them clean and dirty? It was so that we could manipulate the valence of the groups. So we have a positive group and a negative group. And if you had to choose, I think you would want to be in the clean water rather than the dirty dustbin. So these are status orientated groups, uh, a positive one and a negative one. We also wanted people to try to identify with these groups, to try to feel a sense of belonging to one or more of these or, or other of these groups. So we gave participants their own code number, which was either 3 or 14. And those numbers appeared in one of the two groups. So you can see in this particular picture, unfortunately for you, as, a, as being either number 3 or number 14, you are a member of the Dirty Dustbin group. So, um, but in other diagrams, you, you get lucky, don't worry. We'd swap these numbers around. So in other diagrams, your number, let's say your number 3, would appear in the clean group. So you'd be faced with a series of these screens and sometimes you go, oh look, there I am, all dirty, or here I am, all clean. So in each trial, in each different screen that we put up, different code numbers were assigned to different groups, and hence the people in each participant's in-group and the associated out-group changed from trial to trial. So you wouldn't always be with number 18, you might be with, uh, with other people. Now, participants' own code numbers were assigned to the clean and dirty groups an equal number of times during 64 experimental trials. And this part of the procedure manipulated the valence of the in-group and the out-group. Hence, on some trials, participants' in-group was positive, the clean bucket, and the out-group was negative, the dirty dustbin. And on other trials, the in-group was negative, the dirty dustbin, and the out-group was positive. During each trial presentation, participants were given five seconds to memorize which people belonged to which group. The diagram was then removed, a person's code number was presented, and participants were asked to recall which group the person had belonged to. So it would be a bit like that. You'd see this, you'd look at it for five seconds, and then you'd get that, and you'd have to respond on the keyboard, which group did that person belong to, clean or dirty? So participants responded by pressing a key on the left of the keyboard, if they believed that the target person belonged to the clean group, and a key on the right of the keyboard if they, belonged the, if they believed that the target person belonged to the dirty group. Different code numbers were selected as targets to be recalled in different trials. So participants were asked to recall the location of 16 targets who were in the clean bucket with them, and those would be positive in-group members. 16 people who were in the dirty dustbin with them, so those would be negative in-group members. 16 who were in the clean bucket when they were in the dirty dustbin, so those would be positive out-group members, and 16 who were in the dirty dustbin when they were in the clean bucket, so those would be negative out-group members. And our predictions regarding the in-group over-exclusion effect related to those instances in which participants made errors in the memory recall task and misassigned a target person to the incorrect group. So participant number 18 was actually in the in-group in the diagram I just showed you. Uh, there he or she is. Um, and the question is, would participants be more likely to misassign number 18 to the out group? Because, okay, so there's you, number three. This is your in-group. There's number 18. And at number 18 is an in-group member, part of your group, part of your dirty, dirty group, right? Um, the question is, when this disappears and you're confronted with this, where do you put that person? Would you be more likely to misassign number 18 
to the outgroup when the ingroup is negative and the outgroup is positive? Or would you be more likely to misassign this person to the outgroup when the outgroup is negative? So if this was dirty and this was clean. If the in-group over-exclusion effect is driven by motivational concerns, then we would expect that the misassignment would be most likely when the in-group is positive and the out-group is negative, because in that case, participants would be more motivated to want to keep the negative out-group member out of their nice, clean bucket of water, their lovely, clean in-group. So we coded the data from the experimental trials to indicate whether participants had misassigned targets to their in-group or to their out-group, as, as well as whether they misassigned targets to the positive clean group or the negative dirty group. And we conducted a two-group type, whether the group was in-group or out-group, by two-group valence, whether it was a positive clean or negative dirty group, repeated measures ANOVA on that misassignment data. And consistent with previous research, there was a significant main effect of group type that was indicated, uh, that indicated an in-group over-exclusion effect. So on average, participants misassigned more in-group members to the out-group than they misassigned out-group members to the in-group. And that's exactly what previous research has found. People, if they're in doubt, and they would be in doubt a lot of time here, they're making misassignments, which indicates that they're not really sure. Oh, I don't know. And they get it wrong. Uh, so in that situation, people say, well, they probably belong to the other group, not mine. But this main effect was qualified by a significant two-way interaction between group type and group valence. And you can see that uh, in this graph here. So to investigate the two-way interaction, we tested the effect of group type, in-group, out-group, at each level of group valence, positive or negative. So we looked basically to see whether, so here you've got the misassignments to the in-group, and here you've got misassignments to the out-group. So this is the in-group misassignments and the out-group misassignments in both cases. Green here means that it's in a situation where the in-group was negative and the out-group was positive, and red means that your group, the in-group, was positive, and the other group, the out-group, was negative. And we basically looked to see whether there was a difference in misassignments between the in-group and out-group at each level. Um, and we found that the in, there was an in-group over-exclusion effect. Okay? So when the, your group was positive and the other group was negative, then you tended to make more misassignments to the out-group than to the in-group. In other words, if you weren't sure and you felt you were going to get it wrong, you would get it wrong by saying, well, this person's probably an out-group member not an in-group member, and that's the classic in-group over-exclusion effect. Interestingly, however, when you, when you belonged to a negative in-group, when you were in the dirty, uh, the dirty bucket, sorry, the dirty dustbin, and you were faced with someone and you had to decide, well, does this person belong to my dirty bucket or not, there was basically no motivation for you to kick the person out. You didn't belong to the pristine, clean bucket, and so uh, you weren't worried about keeping it clean. You belonged with the scum. You were down there in the dirty dustbin. You've got no motivation. It was like, yeah, okay, I don't really care where this person belongs. I'll, I'll just say they belong or, not, or they don't belong to my group. I've got no vested interest in it. Um, we're all in a dirty dustbin here. There's no reason to kick this person out and to say that they belong to the other group. And that's what happened here. So when you belong to a negative in-group, in uh, there was no in-group over-exclusion effect, which falls in line with this motivational explanation. Basically, what that graph is showing is that it, you will only exclude people from your group when you have a sense of pride in your group, when, you, when, you, when your group has the potential to provide self-esteem for you. And that's the case for a clean bucket, certainly not the case for a dirty dustbin. So we also tested prediction two, and that relates back to that measure of self-esteem that I was talking about. Um, so we computed an index that represented the in-group over-exclusion effect by subtracting the number of misassignments to the in-group from the number of misassignments to the out-group. And on that index, larger positive scores indicated a larger in-group over-exclusion effect. And we found that self-esteem scores on the Rosenberg scale 
negatively predicted the overall in-group over-exclusion effect and the in-group over-exclusion effect when the in-group was relatively positive. So consistent with predictions then, the lower people's self-esteem and the greater their need for self-esteem, the more likely they were to show the in-group over-exclusion effect by misassigning targets to their out-group, to the out-group rather than to the in-group. So again, that, that fits in. It's another piece of the puzzle. We've got two lines of evidence here which are converging on this idea that it's all about self-esteem. That you'll show the in-group over-exclusion effect only if A, you belong to a good group and you don't want to sully it without group members who are a bit iffy, and B, you actually have a need for self-esteem because you don't feel so good about yourself at the moment and you kind of want to kick people out of your group in order to get a better group which will then contribute to your own self-esteem. So these two lines of evidence seem to converge on this social identity explanation. They provide a bit more evidence than we originally had from, uh, from Italy uh, because they tell us yes, identity is involved, but also self-esteem uh, and pride in one's group seems to be involved as well. So the summary then, participants over-excluded people from in-group when it was relatively positive, but not when it was relatively negative. People with low self-esteem showed the strongest IO, in-group over-exclusion effect, both in general and when the in-group had a positive valence. So those results are, provide a relatively direct and conclusive support for Lane's and Isabeth's motivational explanation. Previous research has demonstrated the moderating effect of in-group identification, and that's consistent with the motivation, motivational explanation. However, it's also consistent with alternative explanations that are based on limiting the size of the in-group. The present research tested predictions regarding group valence and self-esteem that are specific to the motivational explanation cannot be derived from those alternative explanations and we found supporting evidence for them. The present research, by the way, also provides the first demonstration of the in-group over-exclusion effect using minimal groups. So uh, our research shows that the in-group over-exclusion effect is a remarkably general phenomenon that extends from long-lived real-world groups such as linguistic groups and regional groups, northern Italians and southern Italians, to really trivial and transitory lab-based social groups. So if you think about what was happening here, every screen that you're presented with, you were in a new group. Sometimes you're in the bucket, sometimes you're in the dustbin. Sometimes you're with number 13. Sometimes number 13's in a different group. So every screen, in a sense, that you're presented with for only five seconds in a lab, on a computer, you take that on board as being, this is my group and this is not my group. And these uh, processes, these effects that are happening, this in-group over-exclusion effect, this relationship with self-esteem, the idea that one group is positive and one group are negative, these all seem to be having their effects, even though these are such very trivial five-second groups in a lab somewhere uh, at the University of Newcastle in Australia. So I think that's pretty amazing uh, myself to, to, that we are getting um, the same kind of group processes that um, might impact on, on refugees entering countries uh, uh, that might impact on people saying, you're not a member of my group in the real world, happening in these five second groups, if you like. Hello again, I just wanted to let you know about a research website that is available, uh, which provides more information about my uh, research. Um, I talk about not only the things that I've talked about today, but also uh, other research projects that are going on and have been completed. So I do a lot of stuff about social class as well. Uh, and you can also find out about how to apply for a PhD, um, and how to apply for scholarships if you would like to join me in investigating the sorts of things that I've talked about today. So please feel welcome. I'll get rid of my face and you can have a look at the link there. You can freeze the frame and copy that down and go and visit that website and find out more about me and my work. Thank you very much.